Okay, hi everyone, um, this is Jeff. I'm the CTO at National Finance, and um, in these series of videos, we'll be giving you an overview of how the National Finance uh, smart contracts work. Mm, this is gonna be really technical, and so um, for users who kind of want a more like gentle introduction or more high-level introduction to how Notional works, um, I'll point out some resources for you in a bit. Um, but first, I'm just going to give an overview of how the repository is laid out. So we have uh, like a readme file here, which has more technical information for developers about how the files are laid out, maybe some like code size and, and other kind of statistics here. Um, second, we also have the white paper in, in the repository. So this is a more technical sort of overview of how the Notional v2 system works. Um, we do reference the National V1 white paper here, and also uh, these. This is a link to sort of the less technical documentation um, <clears throat> that that I was referring to. Um, in any case, I think it's probably a good place to start just to get a high level overview of uh, the scope of National V2 and kind of like the concepts. Um, in these videos, we're not gonna like go in like we're not going to really explain all the high level concepts so um, it's probably a good place to start <clears throat> um, all the smart contracts are in the contracts folder so we have mocks which are used for unit testing we have um, our math library so we use abdk math for natural log and exponent in solidity we have a bitmap library which is used for um, some sort of bit manipulation that we do um, we'll talk about that in a bit we use a lot of signed integers in uh, Notional v2. So uh, we have uh, sort of a bit of a modified implementation of safe int 256 um, with uh, some, some added kind of helper methods here uh, that we use. Um, then we have a folder called global. Uh, so we have a file for constants. Um, this will sort of reference throughout the code. Um, so it won't go into too much depth here. Um, we have storage layout contract, um, which defines the storage slots. Now we have more storage slots than this that we access uh, directly via assembly. And I'll show you that uh, a little bit later. And then we have a types.sol file, which uh, defines the structs and enums that, that we use throughout the code base. Um, the rest of the contracts are split between internal and external. So all the contracts inside internal will be uh, sort of in these different modules, uh, sort of like um, sort of subject area modules, and everything in here will be an internal function that is going to be statically compiled uh, into one of these different actions. And these different actions uh, are going to actually be deployed as contracts or libraries um, to to uh, to Ethereum, and uh, and they'll be called. Uh, and they'll be the contracts that, that the user actually calls. So um, internal, uh, this kind of like structure is kind of useful because we can wrap these internal uh, contracts in mocks and sort of test them directly. Um, since the code base is so large, uh, that, that's just really helpful for unit testing. Um, we also have a folder here called adapters. So these are kind of like shims or like interfaces for interacting with um, uh, other sort of external systems. We have a governance folder here. Um, so these are contracts that will be deployed separately from the core notional like lending and borrowing uh, smart contracts. Uh, so we have governor alpha here. Uh, this is a fork of the compound uh, governor alpha contract um, for uh, managing on-chain proposals. We have the note ERC20 token, which is used for voting, um, fork of the compound comp token and and a reservoir contract, uh, similar to what Compound has as well. <clears throat> uh, lastly, we have a couple libraries here, Free Collateral External and Settle Assets External. I uh, won't go into what these do here, but these are libraries that are gonna be deployed and called by the actions. Um, so these aren't called directly by users, but um, they're used by the actions. Um, we have a views contract, which uh, holds uh, all the view functions for uh, examining the uh, system state. Um, and then we have this router uh, contract. So this router contract um, is kind of best uh, maybe described as a picture. 
So the way Notional will be deployed to Ethereum is that there will be a upgradable proxy. You can think of this as a Open Zeppelin upgradable proxy where the storage will reside. Its implementation contract will be this router uh, contract, which it will delegate call to. Uh, so the router will have access to the storage. And this router will then examine the um, signature uh, given by the user, the method signature that it actually wants to call, and then it will route that call further to a number of um, number of these action contracts that that were deployed um, as well. Uh, so this will do a delegate call. So ultimately, these contracts will have access to the uh, storage on the upgradable proxy. And the reasoning for this is that you know this is a way for us to split up the code into multiple contracts. There is, uh, you know, as some of you may know, the um, bytecode limit in um, in Ethereum. And then uh, the governance system here, Governor Alpha, will be the owner of the router and be able to sort of upgrade the proxy to a new uh, new router implementation. So when we upgrade the router's new new router implementation, we can route say maybe you want to upgrade this action governance action to a different implementation, we could upgrade the router to point to a different contract while keeping the other contract addresses the same. And so, so that would be a way that we would uh, sort of upgrade, uh, we could upgrade all the code here. Um, <clears throat> so with that, that sort of concludes sort of like a high level overview of, of the how the repo is laid out. And in the next section, we'll take a look at the Fcash market and how users can actually lend and borrow on Notional and, and what that code looks like. And before we dive into the code, it's important just to give a quick overview of what Fcash is. So Fcash is the basic building block of the Notional system. Fcash is a transferable, fungible token within its maturity and currency type. So for example, DAI for FDI for December 1st, 2021 is redeemable for one die uh, on December 1st, 2021. And it is transferable to other users and it is uh, fungible within that maturity. Uh, Fcash tokens are signed. So there are positive and negative Fcash balances. Positive Fcash balances are the result of lending. It represents the right to receive that amount of die at maturity. And negative Fcash balances are obligations. They represent the obligation to pay that amount of DAI at maturity. Now it's important to know that in the system as a whole, for every maturity uh, and currency, the F cash, the total F cash, must always net out to zero. So the total amount of positive F cash uh, netted out with the total amount of negative F cash must be zero. And what that represents is that all positive F cash balances are paid for by negative F cash balances. So all the borrowers are paying the lenders. Now, in this video, we're gonna go through the F cash markets code, as well as some of the trading, uh, some of the user facing trading dynamics uh, that, that, uh, that allow users to actually interact with, with F cash markets. So let's jump into the code here. <clears throat> so in the market.sol file, it's a fairly large file. Now we're not going to uh, maybe cover all of it in detail here, but we will give a quick overview of some of the important bits. So it's probably best to start by looking at the, uh, looking at the object in memory and how it's structured. So uh, each market has these fields in it when it's loaded from storage. It has a maturity, which is which defines the F cache that it's, it's producing. Um, it also has a currency that sort of is, is not in the struct. But we also have three uh, balances here that the market is holding. It's holding the total amount of F cache available for purchase the total amount of asset cash. Now, in the documentation, we will we talk about how all cash, um, all sort of die balances in National V2 are held as C tokens, as C die, so that liquidity providers are always earning some risk-free rate of interest 
on the cash that's being used to provide liquidity. So here we have the total amount of asset cash. Uh, that's what we term uh, these interest bearing uh, tokens uh, available in the markets. And then we also have the total liquidity token. So when a liquidity provider uh, adds liquidity to the pool, they will receive liquidity tokens in return. And the last implied rate here is the interest rate that the last user traded at. So this is the annualized interest rate that the last person who interacted with the market traded at. And this is important. Uh, we'll see as we uh, as we go through the code. Uh, these last two fields, the Oracle rate and the previous trade time, we won't really discuss in this video. Um, we'll talk about that when we talk about the Fcash valuation curve. And finally, there's a couple uh, variables here, the storage slot and the storage state. These are, uh, we'll touch on these a little bit and they really have to do with how we interact with storage in, in Notional. So with that, let's first talk about adding and removing liquidity from the market. So these functions are fairly simple. We can see that uh, when we enter here, so the user is adding liquidity, they will add some amount of asset cash. So this is uh, a C token denominated amount. And they will receive liquidity tokens in proportion to how much uh, asset cash they are adding to total asset cash. Now, notice that when, when we enter this function, we assume that total liquidity is greater than zero. So you may be wondering how we can ensure that uh, if we're adding liquidity. And so we'll talk about market initialization um, in a subsequent video. F cash is added in proportion to the total amount of asset cash. So this is a similar proportion to the amount of liquidity tokens you'll receive. <clears throat> we update the market in memory, and then we update this storage state kind of uh, variable to say that we're updating the liquidity amount here. And this will be used when we actually set the market state. Now this is this line here is important to note. So what we're doing here is we're, we're returning the negative of the F cash that has been added to the market. And this is described here in the Notional V2 documentation about what this means. So when liquidity providers add liquidity, they're doing so on leverage. What they're doing is they are going to mint the positive and negative F cash balance, thus guaranteeing that these two things always sum to zero and they're going to take the negative F cash balance into their portfolio, and they will add the positive F cash balance into the market, into the F cash market. So on net, the at when they provide liquidity, the, the liquidity provider has a collateral balance of you know, the amount that they have provided, in this case, 100 DAI. But as, the, as uh, users trade with the F cash market or the liquidity pool, the proportion of total F cash and total asset cash will change, and therefore the liquidity provider's um, proportion of F cash and cash will also change. And so, what this code is doing here is just uh, representing the adding of liquidity. Here, removing liquidity just happens in sort of the reverse here. The you can, you can see the amount of cash that the liquidity provider has uh, a claim on. So right, the proportion of their tokens to the total liquidity is going to be returned and that will be net off against the negative F cash balance that they have in their portfolio. So now we'll talk about lending and borrowing. So lending and borrowing on Notional is done by trading with one of these F cash markets or liquidity pools. So when a lender trades with a uh, liquidity pool, they will deposit cash, in this case, uh, CDI, which we call asset cash in the code, and they will receive some amount of F cash in return. So in this case, the lender is receiving 105 F DAI maturing on this date. And this additional five DAI that they receive represents the interest that they accrue. Now, in the calculate trade function, we do all this math. 
Uh, we do a lot of math that sort of defines, uh, that basically arrives at this exchange rate between 105 DAI and 100 DAI. Um, and maybe the best way to understand that is to first look at a spreadsheet and um, look at the code side by side. So when we look at the spreadsheet, we first want to set up uh, our market state. So we have a market that's maturing on this day with this Unix timestamp. It has this amount of cash, 100 million, and this amount of asset cash. Now asset cash is denominated in C tokens, and C tokens are not do not have the same denomination as uh, the underlying. So for example, uh, C die and die uh, are not denominated in the same units. And so they have an exchange rate. And when we do all our calculations, we base it on the amount of underlying that the C tokens have a claim to. So in this case, uh, it's 100 million, uh, which is equal to F cash. Uh, we don't need total liquidity for this calculation, so uh, we, we're not gonna refer to it. Um, and now we have the last implied rate. So the last implied rate is the annualized interest rate that the last person who traded with the market um, traded at. So that is the interest rate the last user received. We have three governance parameters here, the, uh, the rate scaler, the total fee, and the fee share. Uh, the rate scaler defines the slippage in the market. The total fee and the fee share uh, define the fees. So the total fee is an annualized uh, is an annualized rate, and then the fee share defines like what portion of that fee will go to liquidity providers and what portion of that fee will go to um, the protocol protocol reserve. Now we also have transaction time variables. So this will be like the block time when the transaction is actually occurring, when the lending and borrowing is actually occurring. So we have a timestamp here. We have the time to maturity, which is the you know the difference between when this when this uh, trade is occurring and the maturity. And then we have the uh, asset to cash, uh, asset cash to underlying exchange rate, which we get from compound. <clears throat> So the first thing we do here is when we go to exchange rate factors, we calculate these three factors and I'll go through them uh, one by one. So uh, we already talked about cash underlying. So what this is, is it's simply converting the asset cash to underlying based on the exchange rate. We also have something called the rate scaler. So the rate scaler is defined in, uh, by governance and then what we'll do is we'll scale that based on time to maturity. The rate scaler defines the amount of slippage in the Fcash market, which we will take a look at later in the code. Um, as the market gets closer to maturity, we want less slippage. And so, uh, so this is scaled, to time, scaled by time to maturity and it'll change uh, as we get closer to maturity. So now we'll talk about the third exchange rate factor, which is the rate anchor. Now the rate anchor, what the rate anchor does is it stabilizes the exchange rate uh, between points in time. And the way we, to understand that is to first understand that the exchange rate, what the exchange rate really is, is it's the implied rate uh, continuously compounded over the time to maturity. Now, since the if we have a last implied of 6%, when the next user comes to trade at 6%, the time to maturity will have decreased, right? We'll, have, we'll be getting closer to the maturity date. And therefore, we can't use the exchange rate that the last user uh, had, the, the exchange rate being the ratio of cash to F cash that they received as a starting point. We have to use a different exchange rate that, uh, that is kind of, that stabilizes the the implied rate that the user will trade at and that's what the rate anchor does so we can look at the code here and there's sort of a more detailed explanation of of what this what that is and how we sort of arrive at this formula but here in the spreadsheet we can basically see the job that it's doing which is that when we calculate this rate anchor and we pass it through the liquidity curve which looks like this 
the implied rate uh, received is going to be 6%, which is the same as the last implied rate. So just looking at this, if we were to change this rate anchor uh, by some amount, you know, we'll see that, you know, if we didn't properly cal calculate the rate anchor, the implied rate that this new user will receive will be slightly different. And what if we uh, if we have a slightly different implied rate, what that means is a user can simply wait for the interest rate to change to get to a point that's more favorable to them and then trade. And that opens up an arbitrage opportunity, uh, which will hurt our liquidity provider. So the next step in Calculate Trade is to get the exchange rate. <clears throat> the exchange rate is the ratio of cash to Fcash that the user will receive. <clears throat> and so what we do here is we do a pass through the liquidity curve. And so this is the formula for getting the exchange rate given the proportion of Fcash, to, uh, the total amount of cash and Fcash in the market, uh, and these two uh, exchange rate factors that we just calculated. So there's a good document that explains this in the online documentation. It goes through all the technical details of the liquidity curve. Uh, but the liquidity curve is a logic curve. So this is what this curve looks like here. <clears throat> and the goal here is to be trading sort of in the middle of the liquidity curve, which will minimize the amount of slippage uh, for the user as they lend and borrow, uh, minimizing the change in the exchange rate for how much they're changing the proportion of cash to have cash. So the calculation is done here. Uh, <clears throat> And the logarithm part here, ln proportion, is done in this function. And there's some sort of special handling required as we as we do the natural log uh, due to uh, like decimal and, and kind of precision considerations. And that's all sort of documented here. Um, <clears throat> so the important thing to note here is that the F cache to account is uh, is a signed integer here. Now we use a lot of signed integers throughout this file and throughout the code, but not all of these values can be negative. So total F cash, total cash underlying will always be positive. Rate scalar will always be positive, and that's checked in the code. Now the rate scalar can, the rate anchor can be positive or negative uh, depending on uh, the proportion. But F cash to account uh, can be positive or negative. So when F cash to account is positive, that means the user will be receiving a uh, positive amount of Fcash in their portfolio, and that means they're lending. If the Fcash amount to account is negative, they'll be borrowing, and uh, they'll be receiving a negative Fcash uh, balance in their account. So that's, um, that's one way to sort of, we ensure we can reuse all this code because lending and borrowing are essentially um, inverses of each other. So we'll kind of proceed here with lending. Um, we see that we calculate the pre-fee exchange rate here using, uh, using the factors that we calculated before. Um, <clears throat> so once we've calculated the exchange rate using the liquidity curve, what the next thing to do, we, the next thing we need to do is apply fees and calculate the cash amount. So the way the notional liquidity curve works is that we can really sort of analytically go uh, one way in the liquidity curve, which is from F cash to cash. And we've decided to do that because um, there's a lot of benefits to being able to like exactly net out F cash in a portfolio, which means you can sort of trade out of a position uh, in the future and, uh, and then sort of have that accrue into a cash balance. And uh, we can do things in the code that limit the sort of accrual of dust in an account uh, by having the uh, F cash markets, having the liquidity curve sort of be centered around the F cash amount. <clears throat> so when we look at this function, uh, get net cash amounts underlying. So this is all done uh, still in the underlying amounts. So F cash is denominated in the underlying amounts. <clears throat> we uh, get the amount of cash that the 
account will receive before fees. And then what we do is we uh, get the exchange rate from the implied rate. So the fee is defined on an annualized basis for all Fcash markets in a given currency. And so given the amount of time to maturity, what we'll do is we'll sort of uh, turn this annualized rate into an exchange rate uh, you know, based on that time. Now, I won't go into all this math here, but essentially since uh, <clears throat> Uh, since these fees are exponents, uh, you know, they're continuously compounded. Um, the fees are applied by multiplier, multiplying or dividing the exchange rate. So you can look at the math here. I mean, sort of there's uh, more of a sort of uh, kind of proof here of, of the math that we're doing. <clears throat> so what we get is a post fee exchange rate, um, which is the exchange rate after uh, after applying this this fee and uh, that's all to get to a total amount of fee in the underlying that the user is going to pay uh, when when they lend or borrow now the last step here is to split that uh, split all these cash amounts uh, up into uh, into what's going to go into or out of the account so in this case, the user will need to deposit, you know, 49 million some odd amount of underlying to receive uh, 50 million in F cash. <clears throat> the market will receive the vast majority of that uh, minus uh, what's going to the reserve. <clears throat> and so, you know, finally we check that all these balances net off to zero so that we're not uh, creating any sort of cash balances as we trade. <clears throat> so that gets our uh, net cash amounts uh, in underlying terms. Now, uh, important to note here is that if at any point we return zero, what that represents is that the trade failed. So that's uh, that's just done inside the the F cash market uh, code for for sort of. Uh, for sort of arcane reasons, I guess. Um, <clears throat> it well, I, I guess to say one thing that it does is it allows us to give uh, maybe a little bit better of a revert message when we when we do revert um, uh, outside of this code. Uh, <clears throat> and then the last step here is to update the market state. So now that now that we we know how much F cash the user is going to receive and how much cash they're going to uh, receive. We, we update the market state. So we change the total cash um, with the cash to account. Note that this is subtracting. So the market is gonna move in the opposite direction as the F cash to account. And then we get, we set the new uh, implied rate. So here what we're doing is we're calculating the interest rate, the annualized interest rate that this user has traded at. And so um, we can see that function here. So we'll take a quick look at that. Um, again, I'm not going to get into all the kind of detailed math here. It's just going to be pretty, uh, pretty pedantic. But we, uh, so in this function, we we calculate the implied rate. Uh, <clears throat> this is a bit involved since we have to get the new exchange rate at the sort of uh, <clears throat> at the new uh, proportion for the market, the the new sort of F cash to cash underlying proportion. And then we take the natural log to convert the exchange rate uh, back into an implied rate, uh, scaling by time to maturity. So this sets the new implied rate. Now, you know, quick check here. So when we're lending, the uh, interest rate should decrease. And when we're borrowing, the interest rate should increase. <clears throat> and the final step in the liquidity curve calculation is to uh, set the market state so when we set the market state, uh, we convert all these underlying amounts, right? All these amounts are denominated in DAI. We convert them to C DAI, and we uh, we update uh, all these market variables, and we return these for the actual sort of user-facing trading code to uh, to put into uh, the the necessary uh, the necessary accounts.